Um, my name is David Bach. I'm the Senior Associate Dean for Global Programs at Yale School of Management. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to this colloquium on business and society. Uh, before I introduce our distinguished guest, let me acknowledge the presence of two other extraordinary leaders with us this morning. Prime Minister Zapatero is accompanied um, this morning by Ms., uh, Mr. Bernardino Leon, uh, who is currently the EU Special Representative for the Southern Mediterranean. Uh, this makes him the point person uh, in the EU for supporting the democratic transition uh, of um, countries in Northern Africa. Prior to his appointment, uh, Mr. Leon was the Chief Foreign Policy Advisor to Prime Minister Zapatero uh, and previously served in uh, various distinguished roles um, in um, the Spanish and European diplomatic service. He's also, along with Edward Said and Daniel Berenboim, uh, one of the founders of the Berenboim Said Foundation, which, as many of you probably know, maintains the West Eastern Divan Orchestra, an assembly of young musicians from Arab countries and Israel um, who um, strive to foster uh, the cause of peace in the Middle East. Uh, the other person who I'd like to acknowledge facilitated the visit by Mr. Zapatero and Mr. Leon to Yale today. That's uh, Tim Collins. Uh, Tim um, is a 1982 graduate of um, uh, Yale School of Management. He's the CEO and Senior Managing Director of Ripplewood Holdings, a private equity fund that he founded in 1995. In recent years, he's been very busy uh, in uh, Northern Africa and the Middle East, uh, perhaps most visibly as one of the key proponents of breaking the impasse, an initiative by uh, Israeli and Arab entrepreneurs to channel private sector money into supporting startups uh, in Palestine and improving the conditions um, for peace in the Middle East. He's also the chairman of the SOM Board of Advisors and helps the schools in more ways that I can possibly list. One of them, of course, is to make possible this extraordinary visit. I'll put this up a little bit. Um, let me now turn to um, introducing Prime Minister uh, Zapatero. Jose, Jose Luis Rodriguez Zapatero served as the Prime Minister of Spain from 2004 to 2011. As many of you perhaps know, he took office under the most dire of circumstances. Just uh, three days prior to Spain's general election in 2004, Al-Qaeda-affiliated terrorists murdered 191 people with a series of bombs detonated uh, on morning commuter trains. When the incumbent party blamed Basque separatists for the attacks in spite of evidence to the contrary, voters abandoned its candidate, Mariano Rajoy, and flocked to Mr. Zapatero, who had prudently avoided a rush to judgment. I lived in Madrid at the time and remember these days very well. In fact, I suppose anybody who lived in Madrid or anywhere in Spain will remember these days very vividly. I also remember the election day and when the results came in showing Mr. Zapatero's surprise victory. Uh, my wife and I took our Vespa, uh, it was really her Vespa, I should add, um, and drove to the headquarters of Mr. Zapatero's party where a crowd had gathered in the evening. Um, and despite the terrible events leading up to the election, the mood was actually quite jubilant. I remember very distinctly when he stepped out onto a makeshift uh, stage to declare victory. And rather than joining in celebration, he was extraordinarily somber. He uh, spoke of the victims, he spoke of the attacks, and he dedicated his service to their memory. And I remember them, uh, how incredibly impressed I was of this gesture. In his first year in office, Mr. Zapatero made good on his promise to voters and pulled Spanish troops out of Iraq. But rather than retreating, he redoubled the country's efforts to fighting Al-Qaeda and the Taliban in Afghanistan, where Spanish troops continue to serve to this day. As importantly, together with Prime Minister Erdogan of Turkey, he launched the Alliance of Civilizations, a platform to facilitate dialogue between majority Muslim societies and the West that has become a UN initiative. And I should note that Mr. Bernardino you know, played a key role in getting the alliance started. Mr. Zapatero's accomplishments in office are considerable. Under his leadership, Spain became the third country in the world after the Netherlands and Belgium to legalize same-sex marriage. Fathers earned the right to have paternity leave, and the country began to tackle the scourge of domestic violence. In a country long dominated by men, he governed with cabinets that had at least 50% women. He showed an extraordinary commitment to fighting climate change and worked to make Spain one of the leaders in the dynamic field of renewable energy. 
He re-engaged Spain's various regions, especially in Catalonia and the Basque Country. And his willingness to politically engage with peaceful uh, Basque nationalists, combined with intensified law enforcement pressure on the Basque terror group ETA, no doubt paved the way for while what now seems to be a permanent end of Basque terrorism. There were many setbacks along the way, and he was criticized harshly for his policy of engagement. But the success of these efforts, his perseverance, may in fact be one of his most enduring legacies. Whereas previous democratic governments had shied away from confronting the legacy of Spain's horrendous civil war and subsequent dictatorship, Mr. Zapatero and his government rehabilitated many victims, funded efforts to find and open mass graves so that victims could receive proper burials, and elevated the national dialogue about Spain's past so that healing could finally happen. During his first term in office, his government presided over economic performance that was the envy of the rest of Europe, averaging more than 4% uh, of average GDP growth per year, and seeing unemployment drop to the lowest levels in Spain's history. At one point, one in every two jobs in the Eurozone was being created in Spain under his leadership. During his first term in office, Spain ran a consistent budget surplus something that you cannot say of Germany during the same period of time. When the financial crisis hit Spain um, after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, Spain did what every other man, government, including the US, Germany, and China, with the urging of the IMF uh, and a whole range of economists suggested governments do, which is massive fiscal stimulus. But whereas most economies bounced back relatively quickly, Spain did not. Why it didn't, and what has to happen for growth to resume and unemployment to drop below the horrible levels uh, it has reached is the subject of Prime Minister Zapatero's talk this morning. Let me just highlight one additional thing about his tenure that I believe is worth <coughs> emphasizing. When his government faced growing and at times vicious opposition to its economic recovery policy and some of the political uncertainty spilled over into bond markets, Prime Minister Zapatero decided to call early elections, six months ahead of schedule. Rather than holding on to power, as most politicians probably would have done, he turned to voters and asked them to give a new government a new popular mandate to boost the chances of recovery. And I believe in this we see the two central tenets of his leadership right from that first day of his electoral victory, a focus on and trust in people and the desire to always put the interests of his country first. Uh, on behalf of our dean, our faculty, and students, it is a pleasure to welcome Prime Minister Luis, Jose Luis Rodriguez Zapatero of Spain to Yale School of Management. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning, and thank you, David, for your kind words. Thank you for this invitation. Thank you to my friend Tim. In the first few minutes, I've seen why Yale is such a prestigious university. It's a prestige that can only compare to that of Harvard. I believe that uh, there's certain controversy regarding this. And I've seen it due to the exhaustive and brilliant report on the political trajectory of my government and all of the facts and events that, without a doubt, I've experienced governing a country that has 47 million citizens, a country like Spain which is one of the most passionate tasks that can be developed in the world, having the responsibility of uh, putting the destiny of your country in your hands and, and transmitting some ideas. That's my task here today, transmitting some of the feelings and sensations that I had what, about what democracy really is and what the political process uh, when you make decisions is and what's happening on the other side of the Atlantic in Europe and uh, to talk a little bit about my country, Spain, which David knows very well.
Una reflexión primera quiero hacer. Just a first thought. Si hay algo que marca If there's something that characterizes our era, que nos toca vivir, the era that we're living in, que van a sobre ella, van a the era sobre that you're going tiempo. to govern and that you're going to make decisions uh, es, eh, about, la globalización. is globalization. Sí, es un, es un gran, que es un gran tópico. Es It's a very recurrente. important topic and a recurrent one. Pero one that comes up over and over, but it's opened a new world to us. A pensar de una it forces you to think differently. A más and it forces you to accumulate a great a wealth of information and knowledge. Y a vivir y cómo and to live al and al prove how when you broaden political and economic processes, including sociales cultural and social processes, Se los de la the uncertainties of risk multiply themselves. La globalization, ha globalization has generated many opportunities. Los países llamados emergentes. The so-called emerging Todos countries, han ganado posiciones. the poorer countries, have now taken on new positions. We are living in an era where we've witnessed tremendous amounts of people leaving poverty, and that's mainly due to free trade, which has allowed many countries to compete with reasonable costs and to achieve better positions. This is happening especially in Asia and Latin America. The emerging countries have now taken the positions of the Europa developed countries, Unidos Europe and the United States, han 15, 20 have lost 15 or 20 points de su al PIB of their contribution to the world GDP in only 20 years. Esto es un cambio histórico. This, in effect, is a historic change. Many people have bet on when China is going to become the first uh, economic power surpassing the United States. In 2017, 2020, 2022, it's a given fact. It's a given. I have my doubts. Understanding the character and uh, the sense of fight that the United States has, I don't think that they'll allow the Chinese to take on the first global position. It's probable that the U.S. is going to come up with something to counter this. At present, they're very dedicated to new sources of energy and non-conventional gas. And they're proving that they have a great capacity to supply themselves uh, with energy and even to export it. And this is going to change uh, the way things stand. But the truth is that the West has lost its uh, economic position. It occupies a smaller part because of the uh, erosion that's happened in the developed countries. Most of the developed countries, vis-a-vis -vis this push from the emerging countries, this pressure from the emerging countries, have had to go into debt, an excessive debt. In the last 20 years, the debt of uh, the developed countries has multiplied fourfold. And in order, uh, they've done that in order to maintain their style of living and their capacity to produce. And they've gone into debt with the money from the emerging countries, which have a great wealth and many reserves. Why has this happened? Because the salaries of the workers who produce, and produce intensively, are still very low. And until they don't become large consumers, we'll see how the savings continues to be in these emerging markets.
in these emerging countries. This is the last reason for the financial crisis which happened and came about in 2008 in the United States. Let us say that the West uh, became more indebted and this led to shadow banking banks that were non-regulated, that had uh, very few guarantees and were unsafe, which led to the financial crisis. I'm very interested in this idea above all. The financial crisis is an indirect uh, effect of globalization, which hadn't been foreseen, which led the West to go into debt. And then in Europe, you know that the Eurozone has been the zone, the area in the world that has suffered uh, because of this financial crisis the most. Why has this happened? Because Europe launched a project 10 years ago. It was the Euro. This was a project that had more political will than a solid economic foundation. It's an attractive project. It completes what the Europeans have been wishing for to be 27 countries, but that we can act as one nation. That we we become an integrated entity, not only because it's a guarantee of peace and democracy for the European continent, but also because in a global world, we'll only be strong in Europe if we're united. If this trend to grow continues throughout this decade, if this economic growth continues, there's not going to be any uh, European nation belonging to the G20 sorry, in the G8 in, 1950, in 2050. All of them uh, will be emerging markets, plus the US and Japan. Therefore, Europe just has one destiny, which is to be united. And you might take the perspective, the historic perspective and point of view, and you can see that in the last 50 years, it's undergone a process where it's united. After ending a century of war and confrontations and two large wars, in 50 years, We've had the results of the hate that was uh, planted in the last three centuries, and this common currency had problems from the moment it came into being. As we say in our country, it had uh, hidden problems, hidden vices. That's what we say as uh, jurists in our country. And it's because we decided that 12 countries were going to share the same currency. But from the get-go, holding unequal positions. And this uh, single currency didn't have the result of achieving a convergence in competition. In fact, what it did produce was the contrary effect. And as always happens, this is an effect that nobody can see until there's not a crisis or until there's a shock. What's more, nobody thought of the Eurozone, not only of the Eurozone, but outside of the Eurozone. Nobody thought that a country belonging to the Eurozone could go into default. It was totally unexpected. And herein lies the key to everything. Why is Europe delaying exiting this crisis? Why does Europe, and especially the Eurozone, 
uh, why does it, it is it carrying such a great debt burden? Why does it have more unemployment? The explanation is because the euro wasn't designed to withstand shocks or financial crises. We all acquired a German currency and a monetary policy from Germany, which is because they were uh, leaving uh, their crisis and it had uh, an expansive effect. And Spain, a young country that had a great potential for growing, received a German currency. Which allowed us to finance the country with all of the potential that we had never had before. What were the consequences? We had uh, money that was at a negative interest. We had a young country with a great deal of immigration, uh, growth on the, the growth of supply and demand, the inflation in our assets, and what we know as the housing bubble, which is also very well known in the United States. So when the crisis came about, Europe reacted uh, with the contraction and policies of austerity, and the large difference in the reaction to the crisis, the difference between Europe and the United States, is the role that monetary policy plays. This is the difference. This is the basic main difference. The European World Central Bank applied a conservative policy, policy, prudent policy, but is having consequences that are very serious for those countries that are forced to have an internal reflection to lower salaries, negative growth in order to get out of the debt and a very difficult social situation because of the high rate of unemployment. The president of the Federal Reserve has stated on some occasions that they will not stop intervening in the market and buying U.S. bonds until the unemployment in this country is below 6 or 7%. This is unthinkable in Europe. Central Bank is a bank of a German mentality, which is not willing to print bills, to have an expansive monetary policy that has as a goal only exclusively to control inflation and a fight to lower inflation even when it's not existent. This has to do with the European Central Bank and the Bundesbank. There are some of the orthodox heads, but consistent heads of uh, the global economy. The United States has a bet on something different, clearly, with its Federal Reserve. And from the other side of the Atlantic, there are people who think that it will be not sustainable and that the U.S. will pay all the scope that is uh, doing of the monetary mass of the U.S. bills and that this currency sooner or later will lose value and it will have less weight as a global 
currency, the reserve. These are the arguments. And that, on the other hand, the euro, thanks to its orthodox policy, will preserve its value. And it will be the great recourse global currency competing against the Chinese currency. Nobody truly knows which one of these two theses will prevail. But these are two main differences in the Western world. And this is the reason why countries such as Spain, Italy, Portugal, Ireland have uh, difficulties uh, getting out of recession because there is a monetary and liquidity restriction that is incredibly high. In a year, we moved from a great wealth of liquidity to a great restriction of liquidity. Markets uh, have been changing opinions constantly. They even change their mind more than politicians themselves. The exuberance, the joy to invest becomes the decision to retire, uh, support of finance, and causes serious problems to economy. The great paradox is that there is uh, more savings and more money in the world than ever before circulating freely through the free freedom of capital movement. And this uh, freedom of uh, circulation can have uh, the consequences of uh, generating um, excitement, joy, exhilaration, and in a short time convert to states of great depression. We've seen this with Europe and the Eurozone, but remember that tomorrow it could be any emerging country. Asian, Latin American, Africa, for now, basically doesn't weigh in in the markets, but it will start doing so. Therefore, I believe that the only conclusion we can draw from this is that if we want to have a, a more uh, ability to predict more security, it's important to implement a global economy model. We need to overcome this stage in which politics and laws belong to the nations and the economy and the markets are global. The citizen has the impression that it's a democratic power, it's a weak power, because it's only for his or her country. And instead, what happens in the world influences as much in your country and in your life as what happens in your country, including in this is great country that is the United States. Three things ought to be done, in my opinion. The first one, to have a constructive, positive dialogue about the division between emerging and developed countries. Based on my experience in the international venues, I have uh, been able to see how many of the things that would uh, uh, facilitate uh, global order, cooperation, rules, uh, coordination, financial systems, uh, 
the climate change no se are not achieved los because the emerging countries Dicen. allege that they're Pero willing, sí. but in the future, a nivel de once they are at a, the level of development of the rest of the countries, tan con el we climático. will be committed to the climate change or controlling the financial system once we have your level of financial development, uh, of uh, financial growth, of development and in uh, the climate uh, arena, in the industrial development. This is the main hurdle to overcome, and there are other things that need to be done. First, to institutionalize to make it more, to give more formality to some forum, the only one, the only one that we have is the G20, in which truly there has to be the intention of uh, to govern at a global level, a global interest, global interests, or of uh, uh, public uh, uh, properties, uh, global level. And in this forum, in this institution, Solo ser G20, that could only be the G20, but uh, it's even more pressing. Es un bebé. It's just a baby in diapers for what the global world needs, uh, uh, the democratic world needs, the citizens. Un to have uh, the commitment, a global commitment, on the main issues and uh, the ability to fulfill it effectively. Those are the issues, financial system, capital movements, currency exchange policy, climate change, migrating movement, and uh, the fight against poverty. These are the global issues, the ones that directly and indirectly affect all countries and all continents, like never before in history. Yes, we do know the human rights as well, and perhaps the principle of uh, universal human rights uh, gain more visibility, but that has a different dimension. It is for this reason that the global challenge is governance, global governance. We need a generation that uh, constitute just like uh, uh, at the time that create a global order of collective interest because we're in an era in which democracy prevails with difficulties as usual I believe we should bet on that and I'll conclude with Spain Briefly, first of all, I need to remind you that Spain has undergone one of the major political and social transformation uh, compared to the uh, developed countries in the last uh, 30 years. We have doubled our wealth in 25 years. And it took us uh, over a century to do it in the previous uh, uh, eras of our history. We have built a very tolerant society that uh, has been a pioneer in uh, many areas, like in freedoms. David has uh, reminded us of that, and I'm thankful for that. Yes, it was one of the countries that has approved a same-sex marriage with uh, all its rights. And 
and basically now we are witnessing uh, its uh, spread to most of the Western countries. I can assure you that these are some of the decisions that are important, those that can directly change the lives of people. Power is always a distant, indirect power, the power from the government for each of the citizens. There are very few times that with laws, with decisions, you directly can change the life. And governments uh, generate uh, many uh, things that uh, don't go well, they go wrong, but some of these are truly uh, very satisfying. We have now a financial crisis as a result of uh, uh, the Euro design. Spain had been a very backwards country after many years of dictatorships. There were no Spanish companies in the world. And in hardly 15, 20 years, now we have uh, leading companies in renewable energy sector, in telecommunications, in uh, um, constructing companies, construction companies, and of course uh, in the food and agriculture industry. Uh, we are always ranked first uh, as chefs uh, that are internationally renowned, and as you know in textile uh, industry with Zara, of course, Unbeatable, which is uh, the most profitable company that Europe uh, has had uh, in the past few years. What I'd like to call the attention on is that this has been done in 20 years, even less than that. And that it was an initiative for growth with uh, in depthness, there was no other way of doing it because Spain uh, had a, a scarce um, a wealth. And with this in depthness, once the crisis uh, comes, we have liquidity um, that imposes itself, and that causes a hard process of getting out of uh, debt. But this is a history where many things have been done right. And in the last few years, we've recovered. And there are many things that we've improved. Our capacity to compete. And our potential in very important sectors like tourism continues to improve and grow. And it's true that we've always had the tendency to dedicate a great deal of efforts to savings and also housing. Uh, my country is a country where the most homes are owned. 86% of families own their home. And each family owns a home and a half. on average, and that's where we've had one of our biggest problems. We had a very strong housing bubble, but in my country, uh, construction plays a very important role in our economy, construction of houses, and now there's a reconversion process, and have no doubt about it. Spain will once again become a financially strong country. It's always been attractive. That's never gone away. As you well know, we're always fighting in the rankings with France and the United States as a country that atta attracts the most tourists in the world. We're ranked second for tourism income. And tourism is 
is and is going to be one of the biggest engines in the world economy. I'd like to point that out. In just 15 years, we've gone from having 200 million tourists a world to having a billion tourists. We'll reach a billion tourists in a very short time. China, with certain differences, is uh, the country that has the most tourists who travel abroad. Just a few, year ago, a few years ago, they were very low in the ranking. And perhaps it's one of the activities that's going to grow the most uh, globally. And of course, we have all of our competitive capacity in uh, technology and innovation. which is going to have a very strong capacity. And last, and have no doubt about this, the euro, even in its most difficult times, is a currency that we cannot doubt. Nobody has any doubt that, uh, about its possibility to survive. And what is going to come about is that more countries are going to join the euro. Why? Because it's a political project. And governments will do everything in their power, if everything necessary, if there's a risk, including Germany, which is very important. Uh, the Europeans will not allow that the European unity which is the most important uh, project for civilization in the 20th century, uh, come into doubt. And now I'd like to have questions and answers, which will be much more interesting. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Tepperoro, for sharing this invaluable experience with us. Um, my question would be that when political interest conflicts with economic interest, that always creates uh, usually economic crisis, which uh, will affect the country in the long term. And as for in uh, Spain, Spain's case, um, adopting of a powerful and cheap currency, which inevitably leads to as a, as a bubble, and at the same time crowd out other investments in the industry. Uh, your solution, as you mentioned, is the global governance or uh, cross-country intergovernance that might help solve the issue. But that will only happen in the long term. So what is your solution for the short and the intermediate term for countries like Spain or uh, other Ireland or other European countries? Thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Gracias. Muy bien. Your question has been very interesting. The political decisions are the economic decisions. The bottom line, that usually, those are usually the cause for crises. The problem is that economic decisions or the financial positions are not an exact science. Ni dejan de tener color político. And they're always tinged by politics. Es decir, color político me refiero and when I say that they're colored by politics, what I mean to say is that posiciones a favor de una política there might be uh, positions that are in favor of an expansive Keynesian policies or a monetary policy. Yéndome al euro. Now, if we turn to the euro, el euro Se puso en pie como se pudo the euro was able to uh, be set up 
uh, with a political approach that we were Con able to uh, have with certain political limits, es of cierto. course. And that is true. Pero también es cierto but que it's also true eh, era poco previsible that que we could una not have foreseen crisis financiera como la de 2008. that there was going to be a financial crisis like the one that we had in 2008, only uh, comparable to the pasado. Great Depression de hecho, of the 30s in the last century. La, la, los economistas, in fact, en los años, principios de los años 2000, at the beginning of 2000, the las, economists, in spite of the crises of the dot-com and technology companies, se debatían normalmente sobre si habrían pasado las grandes crisis ya. Were asking themselves if these big crises were over. Es decir, vivíamos lo que se ha In conocido words, como la we gran were moderación. Living what we have now called the big moderation, the great moderation. Tanto, si cuando se hizo el euro se hubiera if when the euro was set up, we had believed that there was going to be a financial crisis uh, no of that nature, hecho. probably, o se hecho we would not manera. have entered into it or we would have set it up some other way. Es que it's true that el euro es, 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 es un proyecto, uh, the euro is an optimistic project. Esa es una fuerza imparable que se contagia. It's an unstoppable force that eh, leads to contagion. Yo recuerdo el día I remember the day que los europeos ya podían en un cajero sacar when the Europeans were able to get euros from an automatic teller. Suponía mucho, eh, no solo económicamente, sino It had a great deal of importance, not only financially, desde el punto de vista emotivo, but also from an emotional point of view. Compartíamos un mercado, sí. We shared a market. That's true. We shared a parliament, parliament Europeo, the European Parliament, moneda, un, una unión mucho sharing a currency that meant a much stronger union. Para, 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 para mí, desde luego, esa moneda, but for me, personally, no, no solo es un that medio currency de pago. isn't only a means to pay. Eh, bueno, al que se puede tener el, un afecto relativo. And we can have a relative affection for it. Para mí, el euro, el billete de for euro, me, the euro, the bill itself, es la democracia en mi país. Es la is paz. democracy in my country. Es el it means que peace. No tiene pena de muerte, it means a continent permite. without a death penalty and which will not allow a death penalty. Es el continente de los derechos humanos. It's the continent of human rights. Donde más igualdad entre mujeres y hombres hay. Where there's the greatest equality between men and women. El Continente pionero en los derechos de It's a continent de that has been the pioneer in gay rights. Y donde un ciudadano, por el hecho de serlo, and where a citizen, just from the fact tiene más that he's a citizen, ante su enfermedad, has more protection. Más posibilidades if he falls ill, de acceder a una educación, he has a greater possibility of getting an education y de tener una pensión. and of having a pension. Eso para mí es el euro. For me, that's what the euro represents. Ahora, en, en el corto plazo, now then, in the short term, para salir de la crisis, to be able to get out of this crisis, tenemos dos caminos únicamente. There are only two avenues available. Uno más rápido, difícil. One is faster and harder. Difícil políticamente. Harder at the political level. Que Alemania in imprima una política más expansiva. And that's that Germany uh, have a more expansive policy. Que los salarios de los alemanes por that fin. That the salaries of the German people. Que salvando las distancias ha pasado lo mismo que con China. Finally, uh, with certain differences, it's, it, they've gone the same road as China. It's had the same effects as China. Empiecen a crecer. That the salaries begin to grow. Su demanda a incrementarse right. su consumo, that there's greater demand, more consumption, y eso ayude a los países del sur. And that in turn will help southern countries. Y si ayuda el Banco Central Europeo, and if the Central European Bank, dando más liquidez, pues, helps out, providing greater será. liquidity, Pero digo, es then this will happen difícil. faster. 
But at the political level, it's El otro camino es más the largo. Avenue, the other road is longer. Más dependiente de cada país. It depends more on each individual country. Reformas, ajustes, it depends on reforms, sacrificios. adjustments, sacrifices. Esos son los dos caminos. Those bueno, are the two roads. Es un debate político al final. Very well. The bottom line is that this is a political debate. Y es, estamos a ver si los caminos se, se, se cruzan. And we want to see if these uh, roads intersect Pero es or not. El escenario. But that's the scenario. Thank you very much. It's really inspiring to, to hear your, your story. Um, there's one region in, uh, in your country that I'm really fascinated by. I've heard a lot about um, Mondragon region has been very resilient during the crisis, um, has a very high literacy rate, um, very low unemployment. Um, I wondered if we could learn anything from this region, if you know much about it. <coughs> could tell us. Realmente Mondragón es una cooperativa yes, muy importante. Yes, Mondragón is a very important cooperative. Que ha, tiene un modelo de, de empresa que ha sido exitoso. They have a business model which has been very successful. Es una cooperativa. Es decir, They're a cooperative. Hay una uh, especie de In other words, there's a type of self-management that they have. Y una participación empresarial and, uh, de buena parte de los trabajadores. Many of the workers participate in their business plans. Bien. Eh, decía que ha aguantado hasta ahora la crisis muy bien. You were saying that they have survived the crisis ahora very well until now. A tener problemas. But now they're also beginning to have problems. O sea que, en fin, digamos que como es un buen caso para estudiar. In other words, it's a very good case study, David. Pero, pero, eh, Empieza a tener problemas. De todas formas, como sabe, es, es en el País Vasco. As you know, Mondragón está en el País Vasco, que es una Mondragón de las zonas más industriales country, de, eh, de España y con una España, industria bastante competitiva. With very competitive industries. Good morning. It's a pleasure having you here and being able to have this conversation. I have a very basic question. Perhaps it's a little bit naive, but I think it always happens among the doctorate students in this university. I'm a doctorate student, and it's a question that has to do with research. I think it's something that might interest many of the students who are present here today. I got my degree in Spain, and when I wanted to get a, a doctor's degree, I was encouraged to come abroad. I've had the opportunity of studying in other countries, such as Holland and Germany. And I've seen that research in those countries is very different. For example, as regards salaries, infrastructure, and the dynamism that we see in those universities is very different. I think that many of the doctorate students here would like to contribute to research in Spain and can contribute to establishing a relationship and strengthening the relationships with Spain, either by going back there or establishing a relationship from here, from where we are now. My question is, why do you think that difference exists in the world of research between the northern and southern countries in Europe? I believe that it might be due to historical reasons, or it might be because of the mentality that you brought up in your presentation, that German mentality compared to the southern mentality in Europe. I believe that also it might be because of the economy, the economy hasn't affected the northern countries in the same way that it's affected the southern countries. What's your opinion, and what could be done to change that situation which exists at present? Thank you. When did you get your doctor's degree? You're doing it here, and when did you finish? In Spain, I finished in 2007. Just when I started the crisis. Yes. Just when the crisis. Just when the crisis was beginning. I'm saying that because it's very good to have a point of reference. It's very notable that Spain has had a deficit historical. It's very notable 
we, we really want to point out that Spain has had a historical deficit in the world of research, en pasión por la ciencia. in passion for science, mm, y en el, en la etapa de, 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 de mi gobierno, and during my administration, tuve la oportunidad porque teníamos I had the opportunity, bien los ingresos, because we had the necessary income, de duplicar los recursos para investigación of doubling our resources for research and development mejorar bastante los salarios de los investigadores and of improving the salaries for our researchers y dar eh, a protección de la seguridad social a los becarios and uh, giving the protection that social Oigo security affords to the reuniones con los becarios people that fellowships because I hadn't I had many uh, meetings with uh, people who have scholarships or, or fellows or have a fellowships in investigation, and they know that they're in a very precarious uh, position. Un dato. But there's Esto es muy one thing that we have to remember. David. It's very important for the non-markets, David. ¿Por qué? Porque Why? España ha llegado a tener el mismo porcentaje sobre PIB de inversión Because pública. Spain has had the same percentage of uh, the GDP dedicated to research. Y donde tenemos el gap, la diferencia es en la And inversión where we privada. Have a gap is in private in investment. A pesar de grandes estímulos fiscales. In spite of very strong, a very strong fiscal stimulus. Si pensamos en la universidad. If we think about sucede lo mismo. universities, the same thing happens there. Lo que no son a las en la What we don't have is companies present in our universities. No hay That Ahora tradition doesn't exist. It's just beginning to happen now. No hay patrocinios, grandes patrocinios de there are no big sponsorships for projects. Hay de, para there are very small programs for uh, doctoral para students. Para so that they can get their doctorates while they're in a company. Es una de las de país. That's one of the main needs in our country. Ha un de apoyo a la Because when there's been just even a small support for Los research, se de the changes are notable. Ya estamos en producción científica, somos la décima we're potencia mundial. Now in scientific production, we're the tenth country in the world. En patentes hemos tenido años And de ser patents, segundos o terceros we've gone from que being the second or third, más nuevas patentes incorporan. Which uh, produces more new patents. Formas, But there's a big gap. Agradezco enormemente tu pregunta. Y But uh, I thank you for your question. Y si tienes alguna idea. And if you have any idea. <laughs> Let me know extender el amor how a la investigación to uh, make this love for investigation and research grow. Bastantes, pues, pues and I think that I try to help a great deal in this. I welcome your ideas. Que los It's true that prejudices are also important. Nobody will, uh, without it, nobody will reject the fact that Spain has three of the most important uh, Painters of our history. Velázquez, Goya y Picasso. Sorry, no ten. Uh, Velázquez and Picasso. Nadie le discute a España que Nobody will in doubt that Spain has some of the best uh, literature of, in history. Como el Quijote de Cervantes. Like Don Quijote by Cervantes. No, no nos discute nuestra capacidad creativa. Nobody will put into creativa, doubt our creative capacity, artística. our literary and artistic capacity. Pero sin embargo nunca se ha reconocido, se ha reconocido but escasamente. It, but nobody has ever really es recognized our scientific potential. Un prejuicio del and sur that's y el norte a prejudice, a prejudice sí. from the north and the south of Europe. Pero that's true. La vida está llena de prejuicios. But life is full of prejudices. También los hay en este país. They also exist here in sur. this country regarding Gracias. the differences between the north and the y south. Thank you gracias. and good luck. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, all the time we have because students have to return to, to class. But uh, um, I think what we saw in this session is uh, Prime Minister Zapatero's uh, candor, uh, his openness, uh, his interest in dialogue and exchange. I'm sure he'll, he'll be here now for a couple of minutes to follow <coughs> up on individual questions. Um, we're absolutely delighted um, that you came and shared um, your 
views with us, uh, that you manage to remind us that at the end of the day, economics doesn't occur in a vacuum. Markets don't exist in a vacuum. There is a social and political context, uh, both when it comes to causes, but most certainly also when it comes to consequences. Um, and we really appreciate um, you sharing mm -hmm. your views with us and being so open to that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.